lot of back quivers have problems. The arrows noisily rattle about. The arrows easily fall out and the fletchings can easily get caught on branches. Thus, due to the perceived impracticality of back quivers, some people make the assumption that side quivers must have actually been more common. After all, there are many depictions of side quivers in ancient and medieval artwork. Depictions of back quivers are also fairly common, but I don't want to get bogged down on what was used and where or when, because it is complicated and honestly, it has also been beaten to death by other commentators. I want to instead focus on the practical aspects of back quivers versus side quivers, as I think that this type of quiver has been unfairly and inaccurately derided, most notably in Lars Anderson's infamous viral video. So to that end, here are three points in defense of the back quiver. Or more accurately, a point about side quivers, a point about back quivers, and an informed hypothesis about both. First point. Side quivers have many of the same disadvantages as modern back quivers. They too can be noisy and awkward, especially when walking or running. And arrows can spill out, and they can get caught on bushes just as much as back quivers can get caught on branches. Second point. A certain recent popular video states that Despite the allegedly obvious drawbacks of the back quiver, the influence of Hollywood, and specifically the influence of the 1938 Errol Flynn film The Adventures of Robin Hood, made back quivers seem more practical and more historically popular than they actually ever were. However, one thing that Lars Anderson overlooked when he wrote this was that the technical archery advisor for that film was none other than Howard Hill. Howard Hill was a highly decorated competitive archer big game hunter and stunt archer who preferred to use a back quiver, and his back quiver was very different than the kind that Lars used. Instead of a stiff tube which arrows could easily spill out of, Hill used a flexible leather quiver that collapsed under its own weight to pinch and hold arrows in place, preventing them from rattling and falling out. I own a replica of this quiver, and as I show here, you can even insert arrows and completely invert the quiver. More often than not, the arrows will stay put. Note that the bottom of the quiver is still stiff, and I am not pinching the arrows to hold them in, nor have I placed hay or a piece of leather or cloth inside to act as a support. The quiver is doing all the work. It also holds the arrows very securely when wearing it, even when in motion. So the quiver that Lars used for his video was either not properly broken in, or it was intentionally made that way by someone who cared more about its Renfair aesthetics than about functionality. So when back quiver critics such as Lars say that back quivers are not proper archery, it really begs the question, how do you measure what truly is proper archery? I would argue that function and success define what is proper, and if Howard Hill wasn't successful, then what is your benchmark for success? Furthermore, when moving around in dense tree or bush cover, there is a very simple solution to the whole arrows getting caught on branches problem. Just rotate the quiver with a very simple motion of the arm. When one does this, it's actually the most streamlined solution of all the available options. And that brings me to my third point, my hypothesis about back quivers versus side quivers. Sometimes they are the same thing. Many historical back quiver designs were equally capable of being used as a side quiver, depending on the situation or personal preference, and vice versa. A great example of this is the simple but very effective design of quiver used by many Native American cultures. The quiver is simply a flexible leather tube with a strap attached. The construction of the strap is such that the quiver can be worn slung loosely over the shoulder to serve as a side quiver. Some people refer to this particular design as a native style quiver. I don't really like that term, but I will run with it for lack of a better description. This particular quiver has some advantages over side quivers worn on the belt. It's a lot easier to control noise and the arrows from spilling out when moving. But the exact same quiver could be very easily slung in reverse behaving as a back quiver if one wanted to use it as such. 
And here's why I think some people would do that. First off, the traveling aspect. It behaves a lot more like a backpack. You can keep your bow in it and lots of other stuff, and the load is more evenly distributed. And you don't have to be constantly holding on to it to minimize the chances of the arrows falling out. Second is the hunting aspect. Ishii is described as using a quiver suspended over his left shoulder. Now, I think that you can interpret this either way as being a side or native style quiver or as a back quiver. That's just my interpretation. And we don't have any photographs of him using his quiver, as far as I know. But the descriptions of him hunting lead me to believe that there are certain situations that would have made him more inclined to use it as a back quiver, such as while crawling and looking over rises of ground. In this situation, the quiver would probably drag on the ground, bang on his knees, or make noise if used as a side quiver. So if it were me, I would carefully sling it over my back to avoid noise and damage. And indeed, we do have contemporary artwork depicting Native Americans hunting and using their quivers in this exact way. In this work of Arthur Jacob Miller from 1860, long predating Hollywood, you can see one hunter crawling on the ground with his quiver slung over his back. And you can see another hunter kneeling, who has done the same, and is apparently allowing the quiver to slide back into position as a side quiver. If you look at other works of this painter, who has spent considerable time in the West observing and painting the natives, you see back quivers depicted fairly commonly in a variety of situations, none of which are unreasonable uses for a back quiver, such as target practice, traveling on horseback, hunting on horseback, and even in combat. You can also see similarly used back quivers in the works of other 19th century Western artists such as Carl Bodmer and Charles Marion Russell. Now, I have to make a mandatory concession. Despite the knowledge that these painters had first-hand knowledge of their subject matter, we nonetheless have to take it with a grain of salt, as the tendency of all artists is to embellish and manipulate their subjects to make it more interesting for their audience. That goes for painters from centuries past just as much as it goes for viral video makers in the 21st century. But having said that, I still think it's worth noting that you can also find rare photographs of these quivers in use as back quivers, most notably by the Apaches and Sioux. 